In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins unto God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence.
O oh God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for these sixth, for the sixth Sunday of Easter is from Numbers chapter 21. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from James chapter 1. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, Deceiving, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He will give it to you. 
Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, ask, and, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father Himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. For we know that you know all things and do not need. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is... The Gospel of the Lord. Let us now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, I whom all things are in, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. And was a great man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped in the world high, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is Rogate Sunday. That's what that's the Latin word on the front of your bulletins for today. And you might be able to guess what it is if you've been paying attention to the podcast I've been putting out about preparing for Sunday, which usually these Latin words come from the 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 um, the excuse me the first word of the the introit Oof. verbs are hard for me to start with. so or, sorry uh, vowels are hard for me to start with my stutter here but usually comes from the introit but today it's a little bit different because if you look at the introit. Rogate really means prayer. It means to ask. You can tell that by the person praying on the front of your bulletins there. It's the Latin for to ask, to pray, to petition, to beseech. It sets the tone for a topic that many of us think we have a grasp on. Because prayer is really simple, right? Well, Prayer is something that can be easy or as complicated as you want to make it out to be, but as with most things, especially in, especially in the church, the more we know, the better equipped we are to appreciate this great gift that God has granted to us. So we see throughout our texts that prayer is the main theme for today. So it's very appropriate for us to look at our gospel in particular and say, what does Christ teach in John 16, verses 23 through 33? Well, he teaches three things, how to ask and pray rightly so that, so that, our, prayer, so that our prayer will be answered by God, what, uh, what we should pray for, and why we should pray. So there are four points. I'm going to try and keep this as, as orderly as possible for today because prayer can get a little unwieldy if you go off in the weeds too much here. Um, there are four points of prayer of how to ask and pray rightly so that it will be answered by God. The first one is God's order and promise. The baptized children in Christ are the Father's children. And they can ask him as such. Because we have been baptized, we are now new creations. We are God's own children. That's one of my favorite things. God's own child, I gladly say it. I am baptized into Christ. That is not just a metaphor. Okay? It's not just a way for us to understand. We are not like God's children. We are his children. And... As I will soon find out, children ask their father and their, you know, they ask their father for certain things, right? They are always asking for things. We'll look at that a little bit more in depth here in just a moment. But we see that God wants us to pray. He orders us to pray, but lovingly. And he promises to hear us. And we know this promise is true because Christ confirms this pledge by saying, truly, truly. He's not going to lie to us on that, on that point. The second point of prayer is faith founded on God's pledge. That to ask and pray rightly is to be done, is to pray in faith that is founded on God's pledge. Now, to fully understand this, we have to know the opposite end of these things. What is the opposite end of faith? It's doubt. Right? Whoever doubts God's pledge commits two wrongs. He asks in vain, because as James chapter 1 says, let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will, that he will, receive anything from the Lord. 
He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Harsh language, but ones, words that should make us pay attention to the fact that we should not doubt God when he gives us this promise to hear us when we pray. So when we doubt, whoever doubts when they pray, they ask in vain. They don't trust God. And even worse, number two, they make God a liar who has promised something but neither can nor will hold to it. If you pray saying, well, you know, God, if you can do these things for me, you know, if it's in your power to do so, that is showing a lack of faith and should be called out. You should repent of these things. Trust in God. He wants to hear from you. He wants to hear your prayers, no matter how trivial you may think they are. Doubting God's pledge is terrible blasphemy. You know, it's strong language here. It's terrible blasphemy since God is the height of truth. God does not lie. He does not deceive. When he says that he will hear you, he promises and you can take it to the bank, as they say. Hearing that faith is such a great thing. We hear all the time within our circles, oh, they have such strong faith. Their faith is so great. Well, if faith is such a great thing, if we know that it's impossible to please God without faith, then we should seek this grace of God diligently and devoutly, confessing and praying, I believe, help my unbelief. That is a very pious prayer, for sure. And this goes along with daily habit, right? It's a good thing to pray daily, night and day. And we've been doing all that we can during this time where prayer is important. Prayer is always important. But right now, when people are facing specific hardships and tribulations, prayer can make all, can, can make all the difference. When we do all that we can. We have congregation at prayer out in the narthex. We have hymnals that are nice and clean for you to take home if you need them. There are prayers in there. But there's also the simple prayer of how Christ has taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven. When you don't have any other words, that is the perfect prayer. It's always the perfect prayer because it is given to us by the perfect man, Christ. So, how to ask and rightly pray, moving on here. How to ask and rightly pray so, so that it will be answered by God. Point number three, that we pray in Jesus' name. This is not some way of doing some magical saying that whatever we pray for always is going to come true because it's prayed in Jesus' name. As if we were trying to trick God into giving us something that we shouldn't have, right? St. Peter says, though, that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, why is this? What has Christ done that his name is so important and that, we, and that we should pray according to his name and his will and his purpose. What he has done is that he has died for us. That at the cross, the work was done so that we could be made children of God and be heard by our Heavenly Father. That when we are baptized, we are baptized into that death. And we have died to sin, and we, have been, and we have been raised to new life. And as new creatures in Christ, we have the right to come to God and ask Him for what we desire. And what we desire as new creations are within God's will. The cross is the center and focus for what it means to pray in Jesus' name. When we are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, that new name is placed on us, and our names mean something. They mean that we are new creatures now, and we pray as such. We give no higher praise to God the Father than by calling on Him in our troubles and cares through, through Jesus Christ, His beloved Son, who laid down his life and was forsaken on 
on the cross so that we would not be. We, the fourth point on how to ask and pray rightly so that it will be answered by God is that, well, we present it in a brief manner, really as long as we need to, yet with heartfelt sighs and longing, all the troubles, anxieties, and sorrows which we face each day. When we pray, we should pray for joy in Christ, who should be the joy of our heart. As dear children ask their dear father, as, as we learned from the small catechism from the Lord's Prayer, as dear children ask their dear father, we ought to have confidence to pray for the joys of our heart. Like I said, pretty soon here, I'm going to find out <laughs> what children ask their father. And being a child myself with a father, I can relate to this, and hopefully many of you can as well, that what do children pray for? What do children ask their fathers for? Do they ask for shelter, for food, for them not to be mean to their mom? Well, maybe sometimes, but typically if things are going well, what do they pray for? Things that are frivolous, right? I want candy. I want toys. I want this nice thing. So we, as God's children, should not be ashamed of asking for those things, knowing that God will give us what is good for us, not only what we desire as if he's some magic vending machine, right? So if an earthly father wouldn't grant a request that would harm their child, and how much more so for our Heavenly Father. Jesus says that if a son asks his father for a fish, but the father gives him a snake instead, that is just unthinkable. So when we ask for things like, Lord, can I win? Let me win the lottery. Maybe that's a snake he doesn't want to give you. And maybe that's why he's not allowing it to happen. There are a lot of perils that come with that sort of Prosperity, as they say. On top of that, praying for the joy that Christ has to give means that, on the flip side, we don't pray for sin, right? When God says, pray whatever is your heart's desire, pray for whatever you want, we don't, therefore, pray in Jesus' name things like, Lord, let me get away with committing adultery, right? Right? Lord, let me get away with stealing this money. But instead, instead of praying for sin, we pray for guard, guarding and strengthening against that temptation to sin. We should pray for, Lord, Father, I have this unholy to desire, I have this unholy desire to commit this horrible sin. Please take this from me. That is how we should come to him in those times of agony and grief when we are tempted to commit such horrible things. Not that we would get away with it, because after all, hey, it's my heart's desire. That's perverse. It's not according to God's will. That is not what will give us true joy of the heart. Something else we should pray for, amongst other things, is joy of conscience. Our consciences by the power of the Holy Spirit preached in God's law are rightfully burdened by the knowledge of our sin. And for that, we should pray that God would grant us true joy of conscience, knowing that our sins have been washed away. That when we gather together here and we confess our sins unto God our Father, we confess that we have been, that, that, that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. And thankfully, God has granted us His grace, specifically heard in that absolution. Because of this, our consciences are cleansed because of who we are now. Again, going back to being children of God, that our sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in the name that was placed on you in holy baptism. This is how we have confidence to pray as dear children to their, to their dear Father. Lastly, why should we pray? Well, Jesus said at the end of our gospel text here, in the world you will have tribulation. And right now we see that that is manifesting itself in ways we didn't even think was capable here in this world, in this country at least. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. So the model of prayer for us as Christians now who are faced with the sinful struggles that are in this world, the model of prayer that we should go to when these things happen and whenever we are afflicted by, by our sin is Jesus in the Garden of, of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We should come to him and ask that he would give us consolation when we are carrying our cross, when we are suffering. Yet, it doesn't stop there that Jesus says you will have tribulation. Because if it was, where's the hope? The hope comes in when he says, but take heart, be courageous. I have overcome the world. And what does Jesus mean that he has overcome the world? It's put very beautifully here by um, Johann Spangenberg, a nice German man who was a contemporary of Martin, uh, who was a contemporary of Martin Luther. What does Jesus mean that he has overcome the world? He means, Spangenberg says, the game is already won. The battle is over. Victory is here and all has been vanquished. All that remains is not to give up, but to hold tight. Even if you see the old dragon, the serpent of hell, viciously spread his jaws, flash his fangs, wet his claws, rage and storm, and tyrants strike and shake their fists. Remember these words, I have overcome the world. I, I, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, I, even I have overcome, have overcome the world. For all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So with this, we should confidently come to God, knowing that He hears us when we pray for all the wants and desires that we have, and also for the trials and tribulations that we, that we surely face. God not only asks for us to pray, He expects it. Having received the benefit of Christ's, of Christ's victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil, and the power, and the power of the devil, we ought to pray all the more. Not just in giving thanks, but also in asking for God to console us in the midst of the troubles and sorrows of this world. Pray for what you desire, even though it may seem frivolous. Pray for the joy of your heart. And yet, submit to God's goodness. And will. You are, because you are, after all, still a child. You don't know what's best and you are not in control. You must wait for his goodness to be shown. 
all the while trusting that he will never leave you nor, nor forsake you, just as he has promised. May this grant you peace, that peace of God which surpasses all understanding, and will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please stand for the prayer of the church. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ, in Christ Jesus, for all people according to according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you tenderly invite us to bring our petitions before you, and you promise to hear us. Keep us, we pray, steadfast in the faith, that we might never cling to your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has overcome who has overcome the world for us. Lord, in your mercy. In your Gracious Father, we thank you for raising up faithful pastors among us to care for your holy flock. Fill them with your spirit that they would never tire of preaching Christ and him crucified for the salvation of all who hear And believe. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Almighty Father, keep this nation under your care and bless the leaders of our land, especially Donald, our president, and Gregory, our governor. Preserve us in safety, liberty, and livelihood. Heal our heal our divisions that we may be a people at peace among ourselves and a blessing to the other nations of the earth. Give us grateful hearts for the freedom we enjoy and for the men and and, and for the men and women who have given their lives to keep us free. We ask you also to preserve all the work in emergency and medical fields. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful Father, extend your compassionate and caring hand toward all who suffer tribulation in this sinful world. Spare us from this pestilence and its effects, and look with mercy, especially upon the destitute, homeless, and those impoverished in our inner cities. Motivate your children to be doers, to be doers of the word and not hearers only, that they would be your instruments of love to help and assist those in need. Lord, in your mercy. In your prayer. Loving Father, look with mercy upon all those who are sick or suffering in, in any way, especially Seth, Candace, Samantha, Darcy, Kay, Loretta, Wayne, Adosha, Evelyn, Sharon, Laura Lee, John, Linda, Orman, Valerie, and Jim. Restore them to health or give them the strength and perseverance to endure. Above all, comfort them in the sure and certain knowledge that their Redeemer lives that they have the promise of eternal life through him. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, 
bring us bring us to the holy altar in repentance and faith that we might receive a foretaste of the feast to come in the eating and drinking of your sons of your sons very body and blood lord in your mercy eternal father we give you thanks for receiving all those who have gone to their heavenly reward before us and now rest from their labors keep us with them in that same faith that together that together with them we may receive the promised inheritance of your eternal kingdom as fellow heirs with your son when he returns in glory on the last day lord in your mercy Hear our prayer. into your hands O lord we commend all for whom we pray trusting in your mercy through faith in christ jesus amen, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.